You're about to watch a great interview on TYT interviews. If you want to watch them live, members are the only ones who get to do that. TYTnetwork.com slash join, become a member, enjoy the interviews as they happen. Hey TYT, I'm Nomi Konst here in New York City with the one and the only Congressman Ro Khanna from uh, Northern California representing Silicon Valley. We've had many interviews with you before, you're a recurring guest on, on our show. And I, I love that you keep having me back. <laughs> Fan favorite. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I'm, I'm just like, all right, she wants me back, I must be doing something <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I feel like every time we have a conversation, I learn so much because number one, you're willing to talk about things that a lot of congressmen are not willing to discuss openly and publicly. And then you're just also championing all these ideas and reforms that have been you know, untouchable or, or even like new ideas that people haven't been able to like break their, their, their brains and kind of wrap their heads around. Well, one of the ideas that, I, I, that inspired me was this uh, idea of democratic experimentalism, which is, you know, you should try proposing ideas. Not all the ideas are gonna necessarily work or make sense. In the New Deal, FDR tried a lot of things, uh, but we need bold new proposals. We're living in a bold time. We're living in a time of cultural change, of economic change, and incrementalist policies aren't gonna solve the economic disparity we have, the uh, wage stagnation we have, and so I've at least said, look, here's what I believe. I'm going to put it out there and then let people uh, decide. And, and that seemed to generate, at least it generates a response, passionate, positive, or negative. Or, you know, inquisitive. Or inquisitive, so, or inquisitive. I think what fascinates me about this, what you're championing, um, these economic reform policies, is that right. you come from a district that is actually pretty wealthy. It doesn't, you don't need to be the congressman who's talking about, you know, the, the working poor and redistributing wealth. A new tax policy. It's not right. you could sit back, be comfortable, and and say, let Silicon Valley, you know, build robots. And <laughs> <laughs> well, it, the district is certainly very, very affluent. I mean, it has Apple and Google and Intel, but it also has uh, working uh, class families. I mean, teachers who can't afford a house, nurses who can't afford to live there, a huge manufacturing base in Fremont and Newark. And so, in some sense, in my district or right nearby my district, I see the disparity. Uh, acutely. I see all of these folks who are uh, got homes in Palo Alto or Cupertino, who are, uh, who've got folks working at Facebook or Apple, uh, doing great. Their kids are making these incredible apps and doing STEM challenges. And then you move 30 miles away and you see places like Oakland and you see a totally different economic opportunity. Or you uh, talk to folks who have been in manufacturing careers or nurses or teachers who say they can't afford to live here. And my view is the challenge of our time is the disparity uh, in economic opportunity to be part of the middle class. Uh, those who are taking advantage of globalization and the digital economy, they're doing great. Mm -hmm. uh, about 81% of households between 2005 and 2015 either saw a decline in their household income or their income stagnate. Think about that, 81%. That same decade, corporate profits were at a record high in the last 70 years. So the economy isn't working for many, many people. Most people. Most people, and they want answers, right? And so this is why it's a little bit tone deaf when the Democratic Party after the 2016 shellacking says, oh, we've got the right message, uh, or the right uh, substance, we just need to tinker and figure out how to get the message across. No, a lot of the country said, oh, we're upset. We have been ignored. They, uh, people who are winning in this economy keep winning, and what are you doing about us? And there was almost this cry uh, from people around America saying, uh, do something more substantive in terms of helping us get a job that's going to be a career, not just a part-time job or a job uh, that's not going to pay a decent wage, and help us have the income that we can afford to send someone to college, that we can afford higher education, that we can have health care, the incrementalist policies aren't working. And so my view going into Congress as a freshman was this introspection. Why have we failed uh, so many people? Uh, what can we do going forward? Let's propose ideas and see what resonates. So one of the ideas that you've uh, come up with is a jobs plan. Yeah. Uh, we've heard of these jobs plans. Can right. You, what's the difference between all of them and how is yours unique? Well, first of all, the, 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 it's a great thing that we have uh, three or four people putting jobs plans together. Stephanie Kelton, who really led some of the economic thinking, I think has moved this debate. Economist uh, who advised Bernie Sanders. Economist who advised Bernie Sanders, an economist who has said, we need uh, a aspirational economic policy that invests in uh, people. And basically a jobs plan is not a radical new idea. It's actually the fulfillment of 
FDR's vision and Dr. King's vision, which was that everyone should have the right to work. Uh, FDR talked about the right to work, not just in the government, but also in farms and in industries and in small businesses. And Dr. King talked about the right to having a job with a decent income. And what this plan would do is say, look, you, if you want a job in the government, uh, the, the, you get a subsidized employment for that. If you want a job in the private sector for a union, as a painter, as an electrician, as a drywaller, uh, as a tech coder in a small business, uh, we're going to subsidize your uh, job uh, and your, the wraparound services that often you need, counseling or job placement. And by the way, you're also going to get a credential. One of the big things we need in this country is to credential and have certification for jobs that aren't college uh, ready or where you don't need college. Why? In Germany, a cook makes about 25 bucks. Hmm. Service workers make $12, $15 an hour. There's a professionalization of work that may not require a college degree. And I think we need to do that uh, for nannies, for elder care workers, for a whole sort of profession uh, where it may not require a college degree. So it's a basically subsidized employment plus credentialing apprenticeships that are going to prepare people uh, for careers in the public or private sector. And they also have universal health care and so many other you know, security net yes. uh, types of, of programs that we don't have here. They do. They have, they have health care. So exactly. So they don't have to worry about uh, changing a job mm -hmm. and doing something that may give them a better economic opportunity because they know that health care isn't tied to their employer. They also have uh, the ability to, to look after their kids if they have kids and can take up to a year off uh, to be uh, parents. They have uh, paid uh, family leave they, uh, and they don't have huge debt when uh, they graduate from college or when they get, graduate from some higher education uh, opportunity. Now, okay, you have a jobs plan. It right. sounds fantastic. Yeah. You're a minority in Congress and right. you're a freshman. How yeah. likely is this to happen? Let's not get everybody's hopes up right. when you have a dysfunctional government. Yeah, uh, it's not likely to happen this time, but it's very likely to happen uh, if we uh, win back the Congress and win back the presidency. And here's the point. Trump has a terrible plan for jobs, but he has a plan. And what is his plan? Stop the immigrants. Stop uh, all uh, interaction with the global economy uh, and deregulate. Basically mm -hmm. tell the EPA don't exist. Right? That's what he's selling the American people. I'm going to bring back your old jobs. Here's my plan. The question for the Democrats is, well, what is our vision? Mm. How are we going to provide folks with jobs in uh, Appalachia, in Youngstown, in Detroit, in Atlanta, in Oakland? What is our vision for providing economic opportunity? And I think we have to have a concrete answer. Yes, partly it can be infrastructure spending, but that's not specific enough. People want to know concretely, how are they going to get a job? Uh, how are they going to get a job that's going to lead to a career and pay well in a time uh, of uh, anxiety and economic insecurity? And so I think we need a clear plan, uh, and then we need to be ready when we do have that governing moment uh, to pass it. Is this one of those uh, incentivized companies to come to your 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 community and pay no taxes and provide no. a certain level of jobs. Okay, because that's the one I'm used to hearing. Yeah, no, no, uh, uh, that I think is could, has so many loopholes uh, and uh, uh, and a lot of times companies don't uh, actually uh, use those incentives to hire new people. Uh, this is about uh, subsidized employment, but it's limited to 15 to 20 people, so you can't be an Amazon or a Walmart and wholesale say okay we're just going to take these federal subsidies and replace existing workforce and there's a huge uh, anti-displacement uh, point but it's not to incentivize companies through tax credits it's to directly uh, subsidize the wages mm -hmm. of employees and that's one of the things i've never understood when uh, donald trump or the republicans talk about tax policy they say well we, we want to raise wages and the way we want to do that is to give tax cuts to corporations and I said, you know, it doesn't take a PhD economist to know if you want to raise wages, just go raise wages. Right. Give the money to the people working. I mean, this isn't uh, rocket science. And yet somehow we get caught up in this rhetoric where they've managed to say they're going to cut taxes, that's going to create jobs, that's going to pay for the deficit. We ought to say uh, we're going to give money to working families. That's going to boost their income. They're going to spend it. That's going to create economic growth. Uh, by the way, that's the only thing that ever has grown the American economy, a strong middle class. Hmm. So um, 
How do your colleagues, your, your Democratic colleagues, feel about this? Well, we'll see. Uh, it's going to get introduced. Uh, you know, some people will say probably, oh, is this really the role for uh, government? And, uh, uh, you know, is, is it, it's too big? And are we going to scare people off? But I think people are scared that they don't, they don't have an answer. There's, what they see is automation is taking some of my jobs. Globalization is taking jobs. My income is stagnated. And the Democrats don't have a clear vision of how they're going to get us out of this mess. Uh, and so I think, I'm not saying my plan is perfect. I'm saying let's come up as a party with a jobs plan. If you have problems with my plan, if you have problems with Bernie Sanders' plan or Kirsten Gillibrand, fine. But the party should have a jobs plan. It's not enough to say into the better deal, we're for jobs and wages, right? The question <laughs> is how? No, I mean, the question is, right. right? I mean, so yeah, everyone's, that's like saying I'm for apple pie and ice cream. Okay, <laughs> great, I'm for, that, that's what I ran on for fifth, yeah, grass, fifth right. grade class president. Well, and, and maybe it, <laughs> it worked uh, then. <laughs> maybe it works. And, and maybe it'll, you know, who knows? I, no one knows American politics. Maybe, it's a, maybe that's a, what, what we ought to run on. But people are, people are, are smart. They're, they're like, okay, you're for jobs and wages. How? Mm -hmm. What's your plan? We know Trump's plan. Trump just is going to give, make sure we don't have EPA regulations. He's going to make sure the industries are allowed to do whatever they want. He's going to make sure that uh, these immigrants aren't taking our jobs, even though that's not true. Immigrants actually create more jobs. But mm -hmm. he's got this theory of the case. What's your plan? And we've got to, as Democrats, have a clear answer. And my view is our plan should be, well, the tax cuts that the corporations were getting, we're going to give them to you. Every family under $75,000, you would get seven to $8,000 at the end of the year. And in terms of jobs, uh, your kids are going to get two years of subsidized uh, employment if they need it. They're going to get a credential at the end of it. It's going to give them a start to a job in the middle class. And by the way, we're going to create uh, these tech institutes across America because we know that you're going to need basic tech proficiency, just like Lincoln understood you with the land grant colleges, that you needed agricultural proficiency. And then uh, in the GI Bill, we knew people, people needed college. Now we know that whether you're an auto repair mechanic, whether you're a machinist, whether you're a nurse, uh, or whether you're a coder, you're going to need basic tech skills and we're going to have these regional tech institutes across America. That's my view, but there are many other views. But my point is we need something clear, uh, an economic agenda uh, that's going to convince people uh, that the Democratic Party gets it. Let's pull back the curtain a little bit. Yeah. Because one of the things I appreciate about you is that you are willing to say some things that, yeah, there's a little fear. There's a little fear. It Sometimes for my better sometimes for worse you know, it makes you popular though um and that's you know if there's anything that's right. great leverage you as a democrat are popular and that's what the democrats really need right now but pulling back the curtain i think it just blows my mind i mean it, it, that there isn't this comprehensive plan that there it's like democrats are are, are deers in headlights right now staring at the american people or staring at fascism not knowing what to do or debating what to do and i i i, I can't help but ask the decline of unions right. in, in America, in the states, yeah. and then also within the Democratic Party, some, some of it is strategic. Is that one of the reasons why we don't talk about jobs in the economy as much as a party anymore? Well, we, I, I do think we don't defend unions enough. So I did a special order because of the Janus decision, which okay. is, of course, uh, basically going to uh, mean that the real assault on unions. I mean, if the Janus decision comes out the way we fear, uh, it will mean unions can't engage in collective bargaining uh, to the extent they do, and they won't be able to charge a fee to individuals for engaging in that collective bargaining. Uh, unions have meant higher wages for African-American women by almost 25 percent, more for Latino men and women by 30 percent, for Caucasian working class families by 16 to 20 percent. These are just the facts. People who are in a union versus non-union, mm -hmm. unions increase pay. And it makes common sense to folks. Uh, if you're bargaining with hundreds of people, you're going to get a better wage than if you're out there on your own uh, trying to bargain with an employer. Uh, but we did this special order on, on the House floor, and there were the usual suspects. Me, uh, Pramila Jayapal, Keith Ellison, and Mark Pocan. You would think the entire Democratic Party would be out there uh, to defend uh, labor unions. Now I get their scheduling conflicts and all of that, and I I'm not saying that other people uh, don't uh, care about the issue, but we need more than care. We need to be on the front lines saying this is what unions have done uh, for the middle class. They're the backbone of the Democratic Party. Do you find that there are Democrats who, 
aren't just quiet when it comes to these things, but they're actually resisting. That they're, you know, the opposite of pro-labor is pro-business or free market. Do you, do you find that there are vociferous Democrats in, in Congress who are saying, you know, no, enough with unions, they're, they're corrupt, or using Republican talking points? You might have heard it a few years ago, but are they still saying those things? I think less so, but there's some. I mean, especially in the education space, where I think teachers' unions have played a very constructive role, and you definitely hear uh, the uh, an attack on uh, on teachers. You know, my view is, if you ask people why certain schools are failing versus succeeding, it just so happens the best public schools happen to be in the richest areas. And you know, we go through all these uh, factors where my view is the simplest is often the right answer. They just have more funding. They get, mm -hmm. they pay their teachers more. They have better schools and we don't want to talk about that funding. And so there has been attacks on, uh, teachers unions and some of the public sector unions, but there also is, you, you know, you can be pro business and pro working families. The point is to be pro productive business mm -hmm. for people who are making things, people who are inventing things, people who are starting businesses, not to be pro, uh, just speculation. And when you have 33 Democrats in the House vote for the rollback of Dodd-Frank, I'm thinking, what constituency are they speaking to? I mean, you had Donald Trump run against Wall Street. Who believes that we need to give banks worth between $100 billion and $250 billion, that we need to lessen the regulations on them uh, and allow for the same free market enterprise that led to the Wall Street crash. What did those regulations do? They said banks can't engage in speculation with people's money. Banks need to maintain a minimum reserve if they are big banks. And they argued that these were community banks. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, <laughs> yeah, I get I represent Silicon Valley, but I grew up in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Let me tell you something. I don't know anyone in Bucks County, Pennsylvania who would describe a bank that has $100 billion of assets as a community bank. This is not a community bank. These are some of the biggest banks uh, in the nation. So this is what hurts our party uh, because I, look, I'm not for a litmus test. I'm for Medicare for all. If someone doesn't agree on Medicare for all, I'll say, okay, what's your plan? You're for a public option. Fine, I really believe Medicare for all is the solution. Uh, I came out early for that. We can debate it. Uh, and the party should debate it. I think we should stand for Medicare for all, but I think let's have a debate about the right solution. But when it comes to this, like who can be for rolling back Dodd-Frank? This is not a Bernie Sanders issue. This is the square mainstream of the Democratic Party. And it undermines our ability to say we're for working families, we're against uh, the moneyed interests, and really hurts us from having a clear message. Is, is this something where, you know, the bank lobbyists come in who a lot of these people are taking money from, from banks, it's no secret there, but do they threaten them? Is there some sort of verbal cue, wink, wink, nod, nod, you're going to lose all of your money and, and, and that's what takes over their mindset? I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't want to accuse people of it, of it being just this, uh, okay, the lobbyist says do this and they do it for funding. I think they've really bought into this worldview uh, that... Uh, that the levers for economic growth are deregulation of banks because Reagan and Paul Ryan uh, have been spewing this for the last 40 years. But what we need is a total shift in thinking. We've got to be willing to say they were wrong. Their deregulation regulation led to some of the severest financial crashes and the biggest income inequality. And we need to return to what built America, investing in people, uh, investing in people having a decent uh, education and health care and having a shot at the middle class and then they'll spend things and they'll be able to start businesses and that's what grows America. Instead, I think they almost have bought in, internalized some of the free market absolutism of the 1980s. So I actually think to give them uh, the most charitable interpretation, I don't think it's okay, they want to just raise money. I actually think it's worse than that. I think they've bought in to the uh, ideology uh, mm. of the uh, the right. And uh, what we need is a clear break from that ideology. You know, FDR said the bankers uh, uh, dislike him and he wears that with a badge of honor. That uh, that helps him, right? That's the sentiment we need in the Democratic Party. Uh, and I'm not saying something that's uh, uh, a uh, novel insight. I mean, FDR did win four terms. I mean, it's, and he, and he was, uh, so he said he was going to save capitalism for for himself for him itself. It was uh, not that he rejected businesses and entrepreneurs. He just wanted to make sure 
that the economy was working for ordinary Americans. There are some interesting things happening in Capitol Hill right now. This tax bill that was passed uh, has, has led to some job opportunities for people that used to work on Capitol Hill, yeah. maybe some former congressmen. You're hearing right. about all these congressmen stepping down, you know, but there's this, this revolving door that exists on, you know, right. in, in Capitol Hill. And it happened after Obamacare as well. Yeah. When Obamacare was passed, uh, many former, you know, Obama, uh, people who were lobbying for Obamacare, whether right. on Capitol Hill or, or in the White House, went on to become lobbyists. How much of an issue is this? Like, how much does it affect the, po the everyday policy making? Well, it's a huge issue for two reasons. One, this is why Congress is at 8% approval. Uh, it's an issue of public trust. People don't trust people in Congress to do what's in the public good. They think they are looking at their future profits or their future earning potential. Mm -hmm. I mean, the president who helped win World War II, Harry Truman, when he retired, uh, he uh, wrote a letter. They was invited to speak somewhere. And he wrote a letter saying uh, he's a bit embarrassed. He can't afford the train fare uh, to go speak. Would they be willing to pay the train fare, right? That used to be public service. Even Republicans like George Voinovich in Ohio, you realize that if you go into these things, uh, you're not going to make money. And or Joe Biden, I disagree with him on a number of issues, but you know Biden didn't go into public service and then get rich afterwards. And yet something has now changed in the mentality where people think that uh, working on the Hill or going to Congress is not just about uh, contributing. It is about uh, a career path to make money. And so there's only one solution to this, either ban lobbying, which I would be for in terms of banning it for former members or staffers, or at least have a five-year or a three-year ban. I mean, I think a five-year ban uh, is perfectly reasonable. So you don't have people uh, writing the laws and then going and advising on the very laws that they write. It's, uh, you know, they can go join Jack Abramoff and, and make pizzas. That's what he's doing now, right? Well, that, I mean, that, I mean he was... He's ban he was know, banned. The, well, the, 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 the sad thing is, yeah, we get, we get outraged on the Jack Abramoffs, but what we don't get outraged about is the legalized influence right. of... Uh, uh, lobbyists and special interests. So these people are not doing anything that's illegal. Mm -hmm. They're going there, they're working on these bills, and then they're going out and making half a million dollars, million dollars uh, by advising on it. And the joke among members of Congress is all of their staff members leave and get much richer than they can <laughs> do because they write this legislation and then they go, go to the Hill. So this has to stop. And it's it's not even partisan. I feel like this was... Uh, the whether it's a Republican, a Democrat, people are just offended by this. And the proof is our numbers. We've got, I go into Congress every day saying uh, we've got an 8% approval rating, mm. right? I mean, and that is uh, the, the respect. People have lost a respect for public service. And it's not because they're bad people, but it's just in this system that has become more about personal gain than the public good. So that'll lead to my last question. Do you think that the Democratic Party should ban lobbyists from being members, voting members? I do. I, I think we should. Here, here's what I didn't understand. I appreciate, Namiki, all the work you've done on the Unity Commission because that's so, so important that we don't have superdelegates, that we allow independents to be voting in our primaries, uh, and that we uh, ban lobbyists from being voting members, and we don't take corporate money. I mean, Obama uh, said, We're not, I'm not going to take corporate money or lobbyist money into the DNC. And he won two elections. Mm -hmm. Then there was the decision made that in 2016, our nominee was going to take corporate money into the DNC. And we lost. Now, wouldn't anyone say, OK, one person won two terms. Now we lost. One of the big differences was money in politics. Let's go back to the DNC not taking any corporate money and lobbyist money. And by the way, if they took that pledge, my guess is, uh, given uh, the success that people like Bernie Sanders have had, given the success that people like Beto O'Rourke have had in fundraising, they probably would have been able to raise millions of dollars saying, here's, our, here's the deal. We're up against the Koch brothers. We're up against the Mercers. Uh, but we are taking the right step in not taking corporate money and lobbyist money. But we don't have the infrastructure of the right. We need your help. Give us 50 bucks. Give us 20 bucks. But they didn't take that approach. Mm -hmm. And this is where it has, it's just mind-boggling to me because in these cases, the right thing to do 
is also the politically smart thing to do. And if Obama wasn't proof of that, if Bernie wasn't proof of that, Beto uh, is proof of that. So many candidates running across this country, pro real progressives, are proof of Randy that. Randy Bryce. Randy Bryce is proof of that. You know, and so people said, oh, it's Bernie Sanders running for president. But no, it's not just Bernie Sanders. There are a lot of candidates now who have shown that that model is better politics. And you don't, this is just common sense, you don't beat a other part another party by being that party light. You have to offer a different vision. You have to offer a totally different set of principles. Trump is appealing to a nostalgia for the status quo, appealing to a traditional set of interests that have run this country. We've got to say, no, we've got a totally different vision for the future, and we've got a totally different inspiring vision for our politics of what it could be. Uh, come join uh, that movement. Instead, of, it seems too much, you know, and, and I get, well, Trump is offensive in so many ways, but that's not going to win over the people we need to win over just uh, being uh, criti critical. What we need to do is offer uh, new ideas, mm -hmm. substantive ideas uh, that deal with the two, three biggest complaints people have, the corruption in our politics, the role of lobbyists and money, and the lack of a clear sense of good paying jobs uh, for folks. It's, and I think if we stick to those few things, uh, we will be a governing majority. Well, you have a hopefully a long career ahead of you. You're a freshman congressman with all these ideas, more ideas than most of the Democrats in Congress have come out with. So. Well, I appreciate your being on your network, and you, you, you allow me to discuss these ideas, and I appreciate what you did in the DNC. I mean, that's uh, amazing work. we got a lot of work to go. <laughs> it's not done yet. <laughs> yeah, well, we got to make sure it passes. Now the real fight. And thank you for supporting the URC, the Unity Reform Commission, and well, our goals. Now, how many Democrats, how many Congress people have supported it? Have I think you, about 35, 35 as, of, as yeah. of today's count. And I think, look, yeah. I think every Democrat in the Congress should support it. They should say, uh, we don't want to be a superdelegate. Uh, we don't want, we, we will, uh, especially on the first ballot, which I think was your compromise, we want the people to decide who our nominee is. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that you don't have to uh, be a registered Democrat uh, a year before the election to be able to vote and participate in these things. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we don't have lobbyists running uh, the party. I mean, these are such common sense reforms. And you've got, amazingly, all these Hillary Clinton people exactly. to agree. So when you have a unity commission that is unanimous, people are wondering, like, why is this even a debate? And so I hope uh, folks watching will make sure that their members of Congress are, understand what's going on and we get all of Congress on this. I mean, that, that is quite the, the amazing thing, is that it was a Hillary Clinton-dominated commission. Right. Uh, she supports the commission. Senator Sanders supports the commission. Representative Keith Ellison supports the commission. And, of course, Chairman Perez supports the commission. Now we need Congress to support it. Yeah, and fight yeah. against you know some of its their own interests. And it's but but it's it's it, all of us I imagine have an interest in defeating Donald Trump in yeah. 2020. And I'll I'll tell you if if we have another nomination contest where people feel even if it's not material if people feel wow super delegates are the reason we got this nominee or uh, the lack of uh, progressive independents being able to vote is why we got a nominee that's not going to help our cause because mm -hmm. we're going to go in uh, to the final election uh, with not everyone on the same team. So I think, how do you get everyone on the same team? You say, we're all agreeing to these rules. Now you decide, you support whoever you want, but here's the deal. Once we have a nominee, we get behind them because the rules were fair and the rules were uh, open. And I, so I think it's in every person's interest who cares about a strong Democratic Party uh, and cares about beating Donald Trump to get behind these reforms. I think that the operative language there was cares about beating Donald Trump. <laughs> Thanks, Congressman. Right. Always right. fun. Thanks, guys. If you like the interview that you just watched, I got great news for you. If you become a Young Turks member, you can watch them live as they happen. Only the members get that. You also get uh, Young Turks live. You also get Aggressive Progressive live and Old School live. Everything is available for the members and commercial free. tytnetwork.com slash join.